In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. A reading from the first letter of Saint Paul to the Corinthians. My brothers and sisters, after a few weeks of doing our prayer based on the prophets of the Old Testament with the idea of familiarizing ourselves a bit more with those great figures of the Old Testament who prepared the coming of Jesus Christ for no less than a thousand years. We now go back the liturgy that our mother the church presents to us goes back to a consideration of the New Testament precisely with the letters of St. Paul as a first reading of the Mass. And today, Friday of the 21st week of Ordinary Time, we consider the, um, the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with the wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. And right there we stop immediately because he's telling us something startling. First, by declaring that he has not come to baptize, but to preach. The first task of evangelization is to preach the word of God. There's a kerygma. To give witness to the word of God with their own lives, definitely, but to preach it with a spoken word. To teach what our Lord Jesus Christ taught in continuation of the tradition of the prophets. To teach the Sermon on the Mount. To teach the Beatitudes. And that's why he would say, not with the wisdom and or the of of human eloquence because let's not forget that the um shall we say the literal sense of this is the context in which saint paul lived and preached the greco-roman culture of his time where people were so uh, attuned to human wisdom human eloquence remember that famous discourse of his in the uh, marketplace of Athens, speaking to the Athenians who were all eager to hear. Remember that the Greeks had the long tradition of philosophers. You have Plato, Aristotle, before them Socrates, all kinds of philosophers, the, the atomists, the luminaries of ancient philosophy. And yet, he preached Jesus Christ. And when he arrived at the uh, part of the crucified Christ, that Christ died in order to be resurrected on the third day, they were amazed. And they said to him, we, will, we shall hear more about this later. And they went away. Huh? It's like saying, yeah, yeah. Hmm? Because it the, the the logic of Christ, the logic of the gospel, seemed to run counter to human wisdom of that time. True enough, how can somebody be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, if he was crucified on Calvary? For not to save them, say, can anything good come out of a God-forsaken place like Palestine, which was there at the far end, in the remote part of the Roman Empire, such that to be assigned governor there like Pilate was, was 
some kind of almost like a hardship post. Hmm? And yet, St. Paul was saying that my, uh, I have not come to baptize but to preach. And to preach not with the, you, the, the eloquence, the wisdom of human eloquence, but the, with the simplicity of the gospel, so that the wisdom of God might be seen and the power of God might be displayed, manifested, shining through my weaknesses. It's very important to keep this in mind because we're living in worlds where there's so much talk. Precisely, uh, social media has uh, made it possible for everybody to make a blog. Um, YouTube is replete with um, all kinds of lectures, all kinds of spin doctors for all you know you know you, you might even equate these meditations meditations to all of those things you know you wouldn't be listening to me if not for the fact that it's so easy to access this collection of meditations and others similar to this one for those days that um, there's no post in this particular collection, for example, there's so many other meditations out there. Well, we're living in a world so full of material content, they call it nowadays, content, you know, that they, uh, a friend of mine uh, owns a company that makes content, hmm? content for publication, content for posting, content for posting in the, in the internet. That is so important to recognize what is really substantial. Otherwise, we waste our time going from one thing to another, perhaps even getting mental diarrhea in the process. Oh, I you know people who have lost their faith from reading all of these things. It's the old phenomenon of Don Quixote once more, you know, the gentleman who from reading all those romantic novels lost his mind and was going around um, fighting windmills, which in his deranged mind, he imagined to be dragons to save his lady Dulcinea accompanied by that um, loafer, uh, Sancho Pancha. Hmm? Well, that's a great, literary masterpiece of Spanish literature, but comedy, mm -hmm. comic, because of its main character, Don Quixote. For not to say tragic, because it illustrates what happens to the vagaries of the human mind who falls for vanities. Vanitas, vanitatum, omne vanitas, we were just considering a short while ago, as uh, the coilet says in the Old Testament, that we have to have what somebody, I think somebody himself said, as a Catholic knows, to immediately detect what is not in keeping with the Catholic faith. And to hold it suspect, to hold it in abeyance and to study further. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the learning of the learned. I will set aside. Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not come to know God through wisdom, it was the will of God through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who have faith. For Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we, we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. 
a stumbling block to the Jews. The crucifixion, the crucified Messiah, and foolishness to the Gentiles. And yet for those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now, after hearing all that, what can we do? What are we supposed to do to inoculate ourselves against, shall we say, the danger of vain knowledge? Definitely, it's not a question of everybody becomes theologians or philosophers. But yes, having enough formation, having enough philosophical knowledge, having enough knowledge of scripture, for not to say Catholic doctrine, to be able to at least detect what is not in keeping with the true faith. To have an immune system against, shall we say, heterodoxy, heterodox ideas, that we immediately form a rash, so to speak, when we are um, given erroneous things. There was a time in the church when Pope Pius Saint, Pope Pius X, instituted what he was then called the Index of Prohibited Books, a list of prohibited authors, prohibited material, prohibited books. Mm -hmm. But with the passage of time, with so much publication going on, that list became unwieldy, and so it was taken away. Not that it now means that there are no more books which are prohibited, but that rather, rather than a list coming from the Holy See, which would have become humongous, it was now the responsibility of a local ordinary to oversee his own flock. In Opus Dei, our father always said that when they took away the index, I put it back, and then he was showing his index finger. Because in the work, we have such lists that he, St. Jose Maria, um, shall we say, established a normal conduct that we should not treat anything that has to do with faith and morals without first consulting the real experts and whether those things are not harmful. Not only not harmful, but are useful for our formation. Because in fact, think about this. If we can't even read enough of the good stuff, why are we going to venture into the erroneous stuff? Or to even to the mildly erroneous ones? That's right, the sure doctrine. The magisterium of the church in the first place. There's so many uh, writings of the popes, documents from the, the Holy See, from the councils. Ask yourselves, have you read all the documents of the Second Vatican Council? There are only 16, you know. Some of them are veritable constitutions, meaning to say they're not just a landmark, uh, documents, but fundamental ones, structuring the church, constituting the church. And yet, maybe we haven't even read them yet. Have you read Lumen Gentium? Have you read um, Sacrosanctum Concilium about sacred liturgy? Lumen Gentium about the nature of the church? Gaudium et Spes about the, the church in, uh, in social life? Popularum Progressio? Uh, faith of nations, international politics, etc., etc. Apostolica Mactuositatem, the role of the laity in evangelization. Gravissimum Educationis, the constitution on the, what do you call this, uh, education, Catholic education, starting from Catholic schools to seminaries, to universities, so many of these things, or 16 of them. And then after that, 
the tremendous magisterium of John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, Saint John Paul II the Great, he will be proclaimed one of his days. You will see the writings, the production of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Wow, the veritable gems of erudition. And now the present Pope, not to be outdone, coming up with wonderful documents as well. All of these things are within reach of everyone because they're addressed to everyone. And instead of reading them to read, I don't know what, opinion makers to read, critics to read, uh, people of questionable theological leanings, well, that's really foolish. That's what happens with those, happened with those Athenians of St. Paul's time, with each ear, so to speak, eager for no novelties. And they were listening to him because they thought here was another philosophy, here was another uh, theologian. But when he preached, uh, Jesus Christ crucified, and they, they went away. Foolishness to the Gentiles. Let's form ourselves well. Because on the other hand, when we have the philosophical ba baggage, the uh, knowledge of sacred scripture, the solid grounding on, on the magisterium of Catholic faith, of, of the popes, if we read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, then not only do we inoculate ourselves against the wrong doctrine, we can even say that we will be better equipped to handle not wrong doctrine, but to handle advancements in theology that makes our faith so exciting, that makes Catholic life so uh, intellectually challenging. And these are the things that feed the spirit. Everything else just feeds the body, feeds the animal in us. And we're not animals. We're human beings, human persons, made in the image of God, elevated to his likeness because of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. And so our joy should be in elevated things, as St. Paul again would say. If you have been saved, if you have resurrected with Christ, que sursum sunt querite, que sursum sunt sapite. Seek the things that are above. Acquire a taste for the things that are above. You see, the opposite of that is the vanitas vanitatum. Oh, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. The kind of persons who are so, you know, you hear them in parties, you hear them in chit chats. What are they talking about? Gossip, uh, the latest, the latest telenovela, uh, the latest shenanigans of the politicians, etc., etc. So there, all there is to it. The human intellect, the human spirit, is made for spiritual things, for knowledge. And nothing feeds it, stimulates it, and feeds it, and awakens it better <laughs> than true knowledge, intellectual stuff. On the other hand, in any case, the vanitas vanitatum, just fatten it. Oh, sure, it's so nice to eat the, the fat of steak, right? Especially if you burn it uh, in La Cabrera, they even make a chicharron out of it. And it's really interesting. Hmm? It's fun eating fat, but it just forms cholesterol plaque. And in the long run, it's not good. It doesn't really give health. It just fattens and causes a stupor in the long run. What really gives health is good, nice, good protein. The same thing happens with the intellect. Oh, you can more or less interest it, titillate it even with vain knowledge. You know, there are people who are 
are so fond of surfing the net for all kinds of um, they, they they think it's knowledge actually hmm? commentaries uh, critics and um, uh, all kinds of charlatans out there but it's not really real knowledge it, it doesn't stand muster of real criticism of real analysis is starting from causes of course within their framework it works they may they, they may be consistent within the error what's important is to go beyond to break the, the the boundaries of that error and to go to the truth and then you really you see how that thing doesn't stand muster but then again that is the the bane of our present civilization it's the consequence of the nominalism of william of Ockham of the 14th century from the nominalism to the cartesian cogito to the kantian and to the romanticism of the Germans and put all that together and you have the modernism that we're suffering from today when you don't know anymore what's right from what's wrong your truth is different from mine your morality is different from mine there's only one reality out there so that if there's only one reality there's only one truth there can be many errors about that reality but there's only one truth because there's only one reality and then just to make it even more exciting uh, now they have posited the possibility of multiverses all father for the each mind and that's what saint paul was talking about and that's what our lord talks about in the gospel of today jesus told his disciples this parable the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom five of them were foolish and five were wise the foolish ones when taking their lamps brought no oil with them but the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps and since the bridegroom was long delayed they all became drowsy and fell asleep at midnight there was a cry behold the bridegroom come out to meet him then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps and the foolish ones said to the wise give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out but the wise ones replied no for there may not be enough for us and you go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves but while they went off to buy it the bridegroom came and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him then the door was locked afterwards the other virgins came and said lord lord open the door for us but he said in reply amen i say to you i do not know you therefore stay awake for you know neither the day nor the hour the literal sense of this of course, it's the phenomenon of the wedding feast of old in the tradition of the, the Middle East, of the Mediterranean, of Palestine. A feast or a, a wedding that would uh, entail days of feasting. But since the bridegroom came from another village, then the entourage, the bridal entourage, had to spend the night waiting for him they brought their lamps i wonder if you've seen one of those lamps if you've seen a, uh, a comic book or an illustration of aladdin and his lamp so those are the lamps they're open on top oil is in them and they put a wick the point of reference is the gravy boat imagine a gravy boat but put a cap on it, fill it with oil, put a cord inside with uh, the mecha, and then the the cord going out, and that's it gets soaked in the oil. Therefore, capillary action, and then you light it. 
But instead of a big gravy boat, those lamps, personal lamps, are like flashlights. They're the equivalent of flashlights in that, um, shall we say, uh, culture, in that civilization. They're small. Not much more than 10 to 15 centimeters in length and 10 centimeters in, in height. So therefore, the volume of oil there would be what? 100? maximum 100 milliliters of oil, perhaps even less, more like 75. And they like that, and that can last for some hours, maybe three, but not through the night. So in order to keep it running for a long time, you have to bring flasks of oil. And they did not. And they when, when they needed the lamp, because the bridegroom had arrived, they did not have enough oil. And so that's they went to buy. The oil for human wisdom, the oil for human intellect, the oil for proper uh, understanding of the faith, understanding of the doctrine, our even understanding of our environment, of our situation, is good, solid formation doctrinal formation, philosophical formation, scriptural formation. That's the oil. And some people want to be wise without having taken the bother of getting the oil. It's like you trying to understand medicine without even having taken biology first or chemistry first. Of course, the easy way out, if, since you don't understand medicine, is just to go to a doctor and believe him. But there are many people who will do that in ordinary life, consult a mechanic, consult a lawyer, consult a, an accountant, consult a doctor. For those things, since they're not those professions, and yet when it comes to things of faith and morals, they seem to think that they can figure it out by themselves all the time. And so they, make, they become armchair theologians moral theologians and they criticize the pope they criticize uh, catholic teaching just because it doesn't square up with their own conclusion based on <laughs> what they read uh, uh, in the internet or they saw on youtube well try curing yourself that way instead of going to a real expert a real doctor and you'll see how fast you die or if you can get better from whatever ailment that you're suffering from. This is the message of today's first reading and gospel. As St. Peter would say, at a given moment, we should be able to um, give a reason for the faith that we have. Gone are the days when we just follow blindly. We have to follow with our head, definitely with our heart, but also with our head. So therefore, we have to be formed. And for that, there's no shortcut. We have to study. Study philosophy. We study a bit of theology and definitely sacred scripture. And read the catechism of the Catholic Church. Because that's the condensation or the condensate of all of those things. There are manuals called the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's like a manual for Catholic doctrine. If you could put a, put a compendium of medicine, compendium of internal medicine, compendium of obstetrics, compendium of sexism, obstetrics and gynecology, well, you can make a compendium of Catholic doctrine. And that's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Read it. Reread it. I promise you, you wouldn't have wasted your time. It won't even get boring if you do it little by little, 10 minutes a day. And you would be following the advice of St. Peter to be able to defend the faith, to be able to give a reason for your way of life. And we ourselves will live that life with more intensity because of a greater conviction of its truth. And our mother, who is the seat of wisdom, 
will intercede for us. Spend a few minutes to formulate your own resolutions and end this prayer on your own. Thank you. 